All Jesus had said was, follow me. He was just a stranger, walking alone. He sounded like he was local, like he was from Galilee. But there was something behind or beneath that voice. When he spoke, it was like the sound of waters, like many waters. And Peter followed. He followed Jesus from the very beginning, if only to learn who this man was. But Jesus didn't spend much time talking about himself. He asked questions, and he spoke in riddles, and he was always saying that the kingdom of God was near, very near. And when he taught, when he taught, it wasn't the same as listening to the scribes, those squinters who saw all of the parts and none of the whole. When Jesus taught about the law, it was as if he was talking about a living, breathing person whom he knew, an old friend he could tell stories about all day long. Peter was there for all of those bright and wonderful days when huge crowds would listen to Jesus teach in rapt attention. But that wasn't the only kind of day that there was when following Jesus. It wasn't just a speaking tour booked out for weeks. No, there were other days, dark and terrifying and haunting days. For one thing, there were the demons, those tormented and dangerous people who shrieked and screeched and howled and did terrible things to their own bodies. Those poor devils seemed to carry death around on their shoulders, and they recognized Jesus. They called him by name, and those dangerous people were afraid of him. They were afraid of Jesus. And with just one word, just a word from that voice, like many waters, and the tempest inside of them was stilled. They had been living in hell on earth and were delivered back into life just because Jesus had said to them, Come back. Be a human being again. Come out. What is Peter supposed to say about that? Who is this man that he's following? Then there was what happened with that girl. That young girl who had been sick. Jairus had been her father's name. She was at death's door, and Jairus came to Jesus and begged him, begged him to hurry. But when they got to his house, it was too late. The girl was dead. But Jesus still wanted to go in to see the body, so he took Peter and James and John, leaving everyone else outside of the house. And he went in to see the girl. The girl was dead. That was plain. She was in the grips of that utter still that once it is seen can never be mistaken. But Jesus sat down next to her and picked up her hand and said, Talitha, kumi, little one, get up. And that utter still took a breath. She got up and started walking around, and Jesus told them not to stare and fix her something to eat. Make her something to eat, like she was coming back from a walk. The girl had been dead, and now she was alive. What was Peter supposed to say about that? Who is this man that he is following? 
A lot of people had wanted to know that. And a lot of people had been whispering all kinds of different theories. Some said that he was one of the ancient prophets from the scriptures. Some saying that he was John the Baptist. Some that he was Elijah, come down from heaven. But one day when they were walking on the road, Jesus turned to his disciples and asked them the question straight out, pulling no punches. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, who had seen things that could not be forgotten. Peter found the words. You are the Messiah. Yes, yes. But then Jesus finally started talking about himself. But what he had to say, what he had to say was terrible. He finally started saying where this movement that he had begun was going, but it was not where Peter had been expecting. Jesus was talking about terrible things. He said that the priests, the ones, the very ones who would want to know that the Messiah had come, that the priests would reject him, and the scribes would reject him, and the elders would reject him, and that he would be killed on a trumped-up charge. This was the first that Jesus had been speaking about what was to happen. And this is the story that he has for them? It was too much. It was too much for Peter to hear that Jesus would spend three days in the grips of that utter still in the tomb. And then that he would rise again? What is Peter supposed to say? So he takes Jesus aside. No, no. This is not what it was supposed to be like. Then that voice, that voice like many waters, turned on Peter like a knife. Get behind me, Satan. Set your mind on higher things instead of wallowing in the muck. Then he was off and running, teaching as only Jesus could. Lose your life and you will gain it. Shame is pride. Poverty brings true riches. It was some of Jesus' most inspired preaching, but if I were Peter, I would not have heard one word after that terrible word. Satan, liar, deceiver, nemesis, All that he had said was, follow me. But it was sure turning out to be a lot more complicated than that for Peter. Following Jesus had meant that he was confronted by all the disturbing things of the world. It meant looking squarely into the faces of those whose bodies had betrayed them, whose minds were infested. It meant not being able to look away anymore. Following Jesus had meant that Peter could no longer simply avoid the powerful people who ran his small corner of the world as if they owned everything. It meant Peter couldn't hide behind his work anymore, catching fish and mending nets and living quietly while the world went passing by. Following Jesus was turning out to be anything but simple. Then six days Past Six days in which Peter must have wondered if he had any future with this man, Jesus. I wonder if he thought about leaving. I wonder if he thought if it might be better to go back to fishing and forget that he had followed the Messiah for a time. But then Jesus called for James and John and Peter and told them to come with him. The last time that Jesus had taken this three aside, it had been on that day, that day with that girl. And here they were again, following Jesus up a mountain, up and up and up to the peak. And there on that mountain top, 
something happened to Jesus. Peter saw time and place begin to bend and ripple around Jesus and a fantastic brightness sprung from him and infused the air so that everything, everything, everything was light. And there were men there with Jesus, talking with him. And even though it was crazy, even though Peter could never have possibly met them, he still knew that these two men were Moses and Elijah. They couldn't be there. Each had lived centuries ago. They couldn't be there. But they stood and talked. And the heavens bent down and the earth stretched up so that the mountain could be not just one place, but all places. And the moment could be not just one snatch of time, but shot through with eternity. And into that bend and fold, a voice spoke. Another voice from around and within them. And in that voice was something familiar. That voice. It was the voice of that many waters. It was the same voice that must have hovered and brooded over the deep places when the world was only a dream. And when the voice spoke, it was speaking about Jesus. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Then it was over and gone, like the memory of thirst after a long drink of water. Jesus, the son of God, walked down the mountain. And Peter followed him. And we who have heard the story before, we know where that path down the mountain leads. It leads to Jerusalem. It leads to the cross. Lent. Lent begins on Wednesday. And in Lent we journey with Jesus and Peter as they travel to the cross. And it would have been too much for Peter to take, too much to stay with Jesus on that journey if it had not been for what happened on that mountaintop. Because there on that mountain, Peter learns something that he hadn't understood, even though he knew the word to say. Peter learned what it means to be the Messiah. Peter learned what had been hidden from the genesis of the world, what had leaked out into the visions of the prophets. Peter learned God's plan. God's plan was to put an end to hatred and hunger and death, and the way that God would do it was not by force or by strength, but by weakness. God planned to suffer, to give up a son, the beloved son. Jesus had told Peter as much that he was going to be killed. But Peter objected because it seemed too awful to lose a great man like Jesus, a tragedy. And it is right to mourn a tragedy, right to work to prevent a tragedy from happening. But for God's own Son to walk knowingly into death is more than a tragedy. It is so much deeper than a tragedy that it bursts out from the other side into uncontained and uncontrollable joy and life and love and light. And God has proven in that that there is nothing in this world that you need fear because the greatest power in this world, the power of death, has been shown to be a paltry shadow compared to the power of life and love that is in Christ Jesus. And God has proven that there is nothing that you can do that will make God stop loving you. There is nothing you can do. God did not abandon us when we killed her son. So God will not abandon you. She has proven that. She has proven it. 
So there is nothing that we can't face, Christians. Not because we are so strong, but because the one we follow turns weakness into strength. We can be like Peter, who followed Jesus even among the shrieking of demons and into the face of sickness and desperation and death. We can be like Peter and follow the Son of God into hospitals full of those who are needlessly sick or dying or dead. We can follow the Son of God into war zones where children pay the cost of old men's foolishness. We can follow the Son of God onto the street corners where children of God, the poor devils, are killing themselves with drugs or pills or liquor. We need not turn away our faces from these sights as if to look away could make them disappear. Instead, we can work and live and love. The Messiah has come. Death has been defeated. Love has won. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.